So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Vinza, and I'm going to give you in this talk a short overview or introduction about uh, .NET Core, which is sort of a new version or new flavor of the .NET framework, and it brought a couple of uh, really exciting improvements. So that's what we are going to uh, look at today. So very shortly about myself, uh, my name is Mark. I'm a developer here at uh, Traffics. And I mainly work at uh, I mainly work with uh, C Sharp, and nowadays mostly with .NET Core. But I, I also do a little bit of uh, GoLang and uh, JavaScript programming. And in the past, I have also done some C++. So that's my uh, background. And if you're interested on the slide, you can see the address to my blog, and you can also follow me on Twitter. So. What I'm going to talk about today is first we will see some of the basics of, uh, of .NET Core. Then we will see what kind of uh, building blocks were required to create this new framework. And then we will look at what are the changes in terms of uh, tooling and deployment. And at the end I will uh, show a couple of demos about the framework. So I realized that this is a, a general uh, DevOps meetup and not a, not a .NET meetup. So I don't even know how much experience people have about .NET. So let's do just a quick uh, show of hands. Uh, who here has any .NET experience? Wow. OK, so almost everybody. So I don't have to go into the basics uh, in much detail. But just very quickly, um, so .NET is a, is a general purpose application development framework which was introduced by Microsoft in 2002. <coughs> so it's pretty mature. And it supports uh, various programming languages, and probably the most important is C-sharp, or that's the most uh, prominent. And it has several different libraries and components for different purposes. For example, ASP.NET is for web development, and we also have WCF for communication amongst uh, distributed applications, and we also have WPF for graphical applications. The one I'm going to focus on today is ASP.NET, because that's what I'm the most experienced in. And also this new framework, the .NET Core, it's mainly targeted towards ASP.NET. And .NET traditionally had two main implementations. One of them, what we usually call just the .NET framework simply. The terminology is a bit confusing sometimes. That is the proprietary implementation by Microsoft. It is closed source and it only supports Windows. And there is another implementation which is called the Mono project. And that is an open source cross-platform project, which is sort of a, another implementation of .NET, <coughs> and mainly targeting Linux. Um, we will talk a little bit about that as well. So let's see what .NET Core is. Uh, .NET Core was introduced uh, in 2014 in November, so pretty recently. Uh, and it came with a couple of really exciting features or announcement. So one of the main goals with .NET Core was that uh, they wanted to make it much more modular than the classic .NET. Because with .NET we are used to usually installing one big standalone uh, installation on our machine, which contains all the libraries that we want to use with, with .NET. And .NET Core is a bit different because the core runtime contains only a very thin layer. And then you can package uh, with your application just the couple of packages that you really require. Uh, so this modularity helps creating more uh, lightweight, smaller applications and packages. The second point is that with .NET Core, Microsoft wanted to allow us to have a much more free uh, choice in terms of editors and tools. Um, what we are used to in the classic .NET world is if you want to do serious development in C Sharp and in .NET, uh, our only real option is Visual Studio on Windows. There are a couple of alternatives, but by far the best was always Visual Studio. Um, and uh, Microsoft wanted to change that with .NET Core. The third point is that uh, it is an open source project also with uh, contributions. So classically .NET was a proprietary application, and at some point they made some of the source code open source, but uh, they never accepted any uh, outsourced contributions, so it couldn't be considered a real open source project. And the 
development of .NET Core now is really happening on GitHub. So the development is happening on the open, and also they are accepting outside, outside uh, contributions. So it's a really open source um, product or project. And the last point is the one which I find the most important or interesting, is that uh, .NET Core is cross-platform, and it supports uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. And that is a really big change, because uh, traditionally .NET was a Windows-only development framework. <coughs> And I think all of these points illustrate what Donovan also said, that uh, Microsoft really, really changed its attitude towards development and towards its product um, in the last couple of years. And I think this is a very welcome change by the community. Um, so by the framework being more modular, uh, you have a more free choice of tools. It is open source and also cross-platform. Uh, and I think this is really nice because uh, many people had the image in their mind about .NET um, as being a bit heavy weight and kind of enterprising. And uh, I think .NET Core can do a lot to, to change that. Um, and the terminology is a bit confusing at times because what we call the .NET framework, now we usually refer to it as the classic .NET or the full .NET framework. And this new version of the framework, this is called .NET Core. And this is not replacing the full .NET framework, but this is sort of a new flavor of it. And the two flavors are going to live side by side, at least for some time. So this is the, uh, the high-level architecture of the whole .NET ecosystem or landscape. At the bottom, we have a couple of common infrastructure components such as the programming languages, uh, the compilers that we use to compile those languages, and certain runtime components, for example, bootstrapping an application, uh, garbage collection, just-in-time compilation, and that sorts of things. Um, and on top of this common infrastructure, we have uh, three main flavors of the .NET framework. On the left, you can see uh, the .NET framework, which is the classic or the full framework. And this is still a proprietary uh, application. It supports only Windows. But still, this one is the most uh, fully featured. <coughs> on the middle, you can see .NET Core. So that is the one I'm going to focus on today. And that is uh, cross-platform and open source. And it is mainly targeted towards ASP.NET development, at least at this point. And on the right side, you see another flavor called Xamarin which is also pretty interesting. I won't talk about it in detail. Um, it originates from that mono project I um, mentioned a bit earlier, and it is mainly targeted towards uh, cross-platform mobile development. <laughs> um, and all of these flavors uh, live side by side, and they complement each other. None of them is really a subset of one or the other, but the .NET framework on the left, that's the most fully featured one, and .NET Core is more lightweight and more modular. And because Microsoft wanted to make .NET Core cross-platform, they wanted to make some changes also in the tooling that you can use in this ecosystem. Because classically, with the full .NET framework, your only real option is, uh, is using Windows and mostly using Visual Studio. Um, so that had to be <coughs> changed if they wanted to support also Linux and Mac for development. So we have a couple of things that we have to think about in terms of tooling. The first thing is the code editing itself that we do during development. So if you want to do development on Mac or Linux, we have a couple of uh, options. The first one is to use uh, Visual Studio Code, which is a new project. The name can be a bit confusing. It's not a version of Visual Studio. It's not, a, it's not a heavyweight development environment, but it's a pretty lightweight code editor. It is really similar to, let's say, Sublime or Atom. Um, but it is uh, supported by Microsoft, and it has really nice uh, .NET support. And it's cross-platform and open source as well. Or there is another alternative called Project Rider, which is uh, developed by a company called JetBrains. And I don't have any experience with it, 
I think it is going to be more on the heavyweight side of the development environment. And I think when uh, the first release version will come out, I think it won't be a free product. So I think this is going to be commercial. Um, and the last option, which again shows the possibilities to choose anything that we want to use, uh, we can also use a, a library called OmniSharp. And that is a library which is actually powering uh, Visual Studio Code as well. And that is the library that provides C Sharp and .NET uh, code analysis, uh, autocomplete, and all sorts of uh, code refactorings. And that library is really nicely picked up by the community, and it is already integrated into all of the popular uh, code editors. For example, <coughs> Vim and Emacs and Sublime and Atom. All of those editors already have OmniShard plugins. Um, although it can be sometimes a bit tricky to set up, so if you want a, comf a comfortable experience, I really suggest you to use Visual Studio Code because OmniSharp in those editors can be a bit tricky to, to configure. So this was the code editing part of the development. And we still need something to actually create new applications and run an ac application, execute a unit test, or package a project. And for that, uh, a new CLI, uh, a terminal tool was introduced, which is called .NET, and that's the one that we can use on every platform to, um, to use .NET projects. And we will see that in, in the demo. And the last point is also a sort of simplification on what we have in classic .NET. In classic .NET, every project is described by a CS branch file, which is a pretty chunky and uh, convoluted XML file and in .NET Core that was simplified and replaced with the project JSON which is a more simple JSON file which is intended for manual editing and the bad news is that um, the CS project is going to come back to .NET Core as well um, which really um, resulted in a pretty much outcry in the community <coughs> people weren't happy about it um, we didn't see the final version of how it will look like. Microsoft promises that it will be simplified, and most of the uh, comments that you will be able to do will be supported by the .NET CLI, but we will have to see. And this is just a screenshot of Vim actually having uh, C-sharp autocomplete, which is pretty tricky to set up reliably, but uh, I found it very funky, so I wanted to show you guys. So besides making the platform more modular and lightweight, there were also some changes in the programming model of ASP.NET. And this is also uh, some sort of simplification. So on the left, you can see that in classic ASP.NET, we had a bunch of different ways to, to handle and process HTTP requests. And it could be a bit confusing at times which one we had to choose because their purpose was kind of similar but their uh, way to use and their feature set was slightly different and I think this also helped the notion that ASP.NET was a bit heavyweight and, and enterprisey and this programming model was really nicely simplified in ASP.NET Core and all of these different concepts were uh, unified in, under a single concept called middleware and that's really cool because in ASP.NET Core applications, this is the only concept that you have to keep in your head if you want to think about an application. So it's, it's easier to reason about how a particular project is, is structured. And this uh, diagram shows an example of what an ASP.NET Core application looks like. So we call this the ASP.NET pipeline, usually. And this pipeline contains a bunch of middlewares. And when an HTTP request comes into our application, it is received by a middleware. And the middleware can either immediately um, send back a response, or it can pass the request to the next middleware in the pipeline. For example, we can imagine that what the authentication middleware is doing is that it checks if, uh, if a correct authorization header is present in the request. And if a correct header is there, then it will just simply pass the request, the request forward to the next middleware. And if uh, the header is not there, or, or if 
it's uh, incorrect, it can immediately send back a 401. Um, so this is a really simple model that we have to keep in our heads about the ASP.NET Core. And many of these middlewares are implemented by the framework and provided for us. For example, uh, the routing for creating REST APIs or serving up static files from the disks or doing authentication. Those are all provided by the framework, but we can also implement our own custom middlewares if we want as well. And we will see a short example in the demo too. And I think this is my last slide before the demo. So I want to talk a bit about what changed in terms of <coughs> deployment for ASP.NET Core. If we want to deploy our applications to Windows, we can still use the IIS web server as we are used to. Uh, but something had to be done to be able to also deploy applications to Linux and Mac. And what we can use on Linux is a new web server called Kestrel, which was uh, introduced together with uh, ASP.NET Core. And the Kestrel web server, I think initially it started up as uh, a development web server, just to have something during development. But actually it was picked up really nicely by the community and it improved tremendously in the last two years. And now it's a really performant, uh, production-ready uh, web server. Mm. Although one thing is important that it's really lightweight and thin, so it is not recommended to make it public to the internet. But if you want to make a public service, you should put another web server as a reverse proxy on front of it to handle things like security and SSL and um, DDoS protection and those sorts of things. Um, for example, Nginx or HAProxy is the recommended one. Uh, via Traffics we use HAProxy, for example. <coughs> and by the way, Castrol is a pretty thin application on top of uh, a library called LibUV, which is a uh, really performant C library for asynchronous I.O. And it's the same library which is underneath Node.js, which is a good sign because Node.js is usually considered a really performant uh, framework, especially in terms of handling uh, many concurrent requests. And Kestrel is built on top of the same technology. Um, and one thing I actually wanted to show you, uh, who here heard about the Tech Empower benchmarks? One, only, only two people. So Tech Empower is, uh, is an impartial independent organization, I guess, and they regularly uh, organize some benchmarks of all the web frameworks out there. And um, ASP.NET improved a lot since the last round of the benchmarks, and this benchmark has uh, a couple of different categories and in one of the categories in the plain text mm -hmm. category which is about just serving plain text content back to the caller uh, ASP.NET Core is the fastest um, general purpose web development framework everything which is faster than ASP.NET is uh, something which is very very lightweight and specialized so all the other general purpose frameworks like Node and Ruby on Rails or Python Django, they are all below in this list. list. And by this, I don't want to say that ASP.NET is the best, but um, what, what this really shows, and also the fact that this test was done on Linux and not Windows, so what this really shows is the Linux deployment scenario is really a first class citizen in ASP.NET Core. And also, if we choose this framework, which is still pretty young, it's just two years old and not that mature, uh, we don't have to compromise in performance. And because we are able to run our ASP.NET applications on Linux, that brings us one really big advantage, the ability to run our application in Docker containers. And I think this is one of the biggest uh, improvements that ASP.NET Core uh, brings to the table. Uh, for example, here at Traffics, we have a pretty heterogeneous uh, set of applications and infrastructure. Uh, we have 
a couple of components which are implemented in classic ASP.NET, and we have some other APIs which are done in various technologies like uh, Golang and Java and Node.js, and now we also have a couple of ASP.NET Core APIs. And just to support classic ASP.NET, we still have to maintain a completely separate deployment tool chain and hosting environment to host the classic ASP.NET application on Windows Server using IIS. And for all the other technologies, uh, JavaScript and Golang and Java, we can use the same environment, same environment, same pipelines, and same deployment scripts using Docker images. And this is really cool because now if we will be able to migrate all of our classic ASP.NET applications to ASP.NET Core, we can completely remove the old Windows Server and IIS based infrastructure and we can deploy all of our applications in one single way using Docker images, <coughs> which is really nice. Uh, and because uh, we can use Docker, we can also use any technology that supports Docker. Uh, here at Traffix we are using uh, Google Cloud uh, and Kubernetes to run all of our ASP.NET Core applications, but we can use any uh, cloud provider which supports Docker like Azure or Amazon or anything really. Uh, so, first I want to show a very quick demo which is about how to create a Hello World in .NET Core. And normally I'm not using Linux during everyday .NET development because still uh, the proprietary Visual Studio is I think the most featureful uh, development environment and that's what I'm the most productive with. But I want to do the demo on Linux just to show that it really works. Um, so I mentioned that there is a new CLI called Docker, uh, sorry, .NET. <laughs> <laughs> That's not that new. Uh, so .NET is the one with which we can interact with .NET applications. We can create new applications, execute unit tests, or start up applications. Uh, and this is uh, what I can use also to scaffold a new application. So I will create a new folder. and I will issue .NET new. And what is created for me is basically two files. One of the files is what I mentioned earlier, the project JSON, which is um, the project descriptor. For example, in Node.js, this, this would be the package JSON file. It is really similar to that uh, concept. And the other file is my only source file. And if I look at the project JSON, it contains some sort of metadata about my project, like the version number, it can contain the description and an author. But what is really important is the part which contains um, what kind of framework this application is going to run on. Currently, in this example, it says by default NetCore app 1.1, which means that I'm going to run on the .NET Core flavor of the .NET frameworks. And this part defines what kind of external dependencies my application has. And because I just scaffolded a completely empty application, it doesn't have any other dependency than the base framework itself. And if you look at our source, uh, source file, which is called program.cs, this has the, uh, the static main method which is the entry point of the application, and the scaffolder by default just creates a hello world for us. And just to see I'm really running this project, I will change this to something different. And now what we have to do in our project first, we have to restore the external dependencies that it has, which is currently only a single package, the .NET framework itself. So I have to say .NET restore. And actually .NET is storing all of the packages on a central uh, location on my machine. So if you already have the packages downloaded for a different application, .NET restore is really fast. And now I can start my application by using .NET run. And because the application wasn't compiled, uh, it is automatically uh, compiled by the .NET CLI, and then it is being executed, and it prints Happy Hawks Watch. 
And if I run it again with .NET run, then the compilation won't happen again, but we will again see the output. So this was the really short Hello World demo that I wanted to do. The second demo that I want to uh, show to you is how to create a really simple uh, REST API by using the part of the ASP.NET framework called MVC. Uh, MVC is the usual model view controller framework that we have in uh, ASP.NET to implement um, websites and also REST APIs. If you don't have ASP.NET experience, uh, it is really similar to the other uh, MVC frameworks out there like uh, Rails for Ruby or uh, Django uh, for Python. And what this gives us uh, MVC, it gives us one built-in uh, middleware. So our pipeline is going to contain only one single middleware for routing. That's the one that is going to handle the route with which we are calling our application. And that middleware is routing the request to our controllers that we are implementing in this MVC model. And what we are going to have in the demo is a single controller called product controller, which is handling some products. And we will implement two very simple endpoints. And actually, with .NET, with the .NET CLI, we are able to uh, scaffold different types of applications. I think I can show this by looking at the help. So I would be able to create a web application as well. But the type of project that the CLI scaffolds is a bit too heavyweight for my taste. Um, it contains a bit too much. So I created a, another a template uh, for the demo. And actually, the way I created it is just I scaffold a new application, and I removed everything that I don't want to show you, because it would just be a distraction. So this MVC application that we have here is basically almost the smallest possible web application that, that we can have. Yeah. If we look at the project JSON, we will see that it's, it's a bit larger than what <coughs> we've seen in the previous project because it has a couple more uh, dependencies because now we are actually depending on uh, some ASP.NET packages for the web development part. And if we look at our entry point, the program.cs, we see that now it contains a small piece of code. And this is a piece of code that you usually don't have to write manually because it is always scaffolded for you. Uh, and what this does is basically it bootstraps our web application and starts it up. And we can customize it in some ways, but this is something that you usually don't need to manually edit. And one thing that's important about it is that this line specifies what is the, uh, the startup type in our project. And this startup type is going to be the type which will describe what our application is actually going to do. And in this case, the startup type is called simply startup. And that is not mandatory, but that is a, a convention in ASP.NET Core. So if I open the startup CS, this is the file which uh, contains this startup type. So this is the type that describes what my application is going to do. And by convention, here we have two particular methods. One of them is called configure services. This is the method in which we have to set up what kind of services our application will need. And service is a pretty central concept to ASP.NET Core because every component that we implement in ASP.NET will have access to all of these services uh, through dependency injection. And currently we are only calling a single method here. This is a method provided by the framework itself. And this is adding all the services which are needed to make the MVC framework uh, work. MVC framework work. Yeah. And the second method is uh, configure. And this is actually setting up what our application is going to do. So in the example I showed you on the slide about the middlewares in the pipeline, this is the method in which we can add all of our middlewares to our pipeline. 
So here we could add a logging middleware and then an authentication middleware and then an authentication or then a middleware about uh, handling static files or handling exceptions. And currently we are doing here two things. First, I'm calling a helper method to add some uh, logging to the console and this is just in order to be able to see something in the terminal. And the second call that we are doing here is adding the built-in middleware for MVC routing. And with this, we have everything that we need for setting up an ESP.NET project using MVC. And this is, again, something that usually uh, you get automatically when you scaffold a new application. And if we are using MVC, the convention is to have two directories. One is called models. This is the one in which I will store all my model classes. Currently, I will have only one called product. So these are the products that we are going to maintain. They will all have a name, the category, and the price. And we have another folder called controllers. And this is the folder which con contains all of my controller classes. And those are the ones which will implement the actual endpoints of the application. And I already prepared uh, a product controller for us, but it doesn't have any endpoints yet. But I prepared a static list of products. These are the products that we will return. Of course, in practice, we would be using a, a database or some kind of repository to get these products. But these hard-coded products are just for the sake of the demo. And let's go and uh, implement two different endpoints. One endpoint is going to be for uh, getting all the products in the list, and the other is going to be for getting one single product based on an ID. So the way we have to implement these methods are based uh, on a convention. We have to use a particular attribute and also uh, a specific signature for the method. So the first endpoint is for getting all of the products. And I want to return a 200 OK response. And I will simply return all of the products that we have. And the second endpoint is going to be for getting only a single product based on an ID. And I need the same attribute, again, on top of the, uh, the method. And here I have to specify <coughs> what sort of route my endpoint will respond on. And for this endpoint, the route that I want to set up is simply the ID of the product. So that's what I want to uh, pass in to the request after the uh, after a slash. And there is a convention about how to do that in ESP.NET. We have to specify here the name of the argument and this name, this ID name, has to correspond to the method argument which we have here. So those names have to match so that the router middleware can figure out what kind of method it has to call and what argument it has to pass. And now in the implementation, what I want to do is I want to do a simple filtering based on the ID. So I'm, st I'm still returning a 200, okay? But I will do a simple <coughs> filter The product's ID has to be equal to the ID. And if I didn't make any mistakes, then it should be ready and working. So I have to do .NET restore again to get all the packages. Uh, again, this is pretty quick because I have all the packages downloaded on my machine already. And then I, will, I can say .NET run. <coughs> oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so this attribute is not called HTTP method, but because I want to respond to get request, the attribute I have to use is HTTP get.
Okay, now it should work. Uh, by default, the application responds on the, on the port 5000, so I can try to call it in the browser. And it works and it returns the uh, hard-coded products that I have. And by default, the convention in ASP.NET is that this route that I pass here, the slash product, that corresponds to the name of the controller that I created. So the way the middleware finds my controller is that it matches this product string to the name of the controller, which was products controller. And I can also test my other route, which was slash and an ID of one of the products. And we see that this works as well. So this was what I wanted to implement in MVC. I don't want to do anything more because I guess some people already have experience with this and it would be boring. And for people who don't have experience yet, it is much more easier to learn it from any number of tutorials. I want to show something which is more specific to ESP.NET Core. And that is uh, publishing this application in the form of a Docker uh, image. And we have a couple of different uh, options if we want to create a Docker image from this application. So the simplest approach, and this is the one that is usually scaffolded by most of the templates that we have, is to not just execute the application by the Docker image, but actually do the, uh, the build and the compilation by Docker as well. So what this Docker file is doing, it just copies the whole repository into the Docker image, and basically it is doing the same thing that I was doing in the terminal before. First, it is doing the .NET restore to get all the uh, external dependencies, then it is doing a .NET build, and then it is starting up my application. Let's see if this works. And now this is actually really downloading all of the images because it is not running on my local machine. And I can uh, start to run it. I have to use the port 5000 and the name of the Docker image was MVC which built because this is the version of the Docker image which is doing the build as well. <coughs> And yeah, the application is still working, and we see that now it is running on Docker. And this is something that is now really a first-class citizen in the ASP.NET Core world. And in classic ASP.NET, this was completely impossible. We just couldn't, couldn't do this. Uh, so I mentioned that this is the first approach to creating a Docker image, and in this case, uh, Docker is doing the build itself, and there is nothing particularly wrong with it, but uh, we can imagine that we don't want Docker to do the build, because we might have our own build scripts, which might be more complicated. Maybe they are really running the, uh, the, the tests as well, or maybe they are calculating code coverage. Uh, so maybe what we want to do is to do a build in a separate script or any kind of tool, and with Docker we just want to execute the built binaries. And we can do that as well. If we want to do that, we have to use another comment of uh, the .NET CLI, which is .NET publish. What this is going to do, it is going to compile my application, and it is going to publish all of the binaries of the application itself, and also all of the external dependencies to a particular folder. And then I can use that folder to create a Docker image, which is not doing any build anymore. It, just ex it is just executing a binary. And for .NET Publish, I can specify what the output directory is. I will say that the output directory is just simply pub. And now if I go to the pub directory, you can see that it generated all of the binaries of my application, and it also copied here all of the external dependencies. And now I can 
start my application with the .NET CLI just by um, specifying the actual .NET binary of the application, which in this case is mvc.dll. And now there is no compilation step, simply the binary is started up directly. And this is what I can also do in a Docker image. So I have another Docker file here prepared, docker.bim. And what this is doing, it is again copying uh, all the content that I have in my folder, but it is not doing any kind of compilation, it just starts up my .NET binary directly. Uh, so for this to work, I have to copy this particular Docker, Docker file into my pub directory. And I have to build that directory as a Docker image. I will call this uh, MVC, MVC uh, bin. And I have to specify what folder I want to build, and that is the pub folder. And I can try this as well to see if it's working. Yeah, and this should work the same way. So this is a second approach to create a, a Docker image for a .NET application. But one thing I wanted to show you, but actually I forgot, is what was the base image for the first Docker file. So the base image was Microsoft.NET, which is a, a Docker image published by Microsoft, and it is based on, I think, Ubuntu, I'm not sure, but some flavor of Linux. And it has all of the uh, .NET tools pre-installed on the machine. So it has the .NET framework and also the .NET CLI. So that is why I'm able to use the .NET CLI here in the Docker file. And if you look at the second Docker file, it is not doing the compilation anymore, but we still need to use the Microsoft .NET base image because we still require the .NET CLI. Uh, and actually there is a way to avoid even that and package the whole .NET framework with my application and then we are able to use just a very thin Linux image which doesn't even have .NET installed on it because it is pre-packaged with my application. Uh, and in order to do that I have to do a small change in my project.json <coughs> file. So at this part where we are specifying the version of the .NET framework we are going to run. We have this type platform property and what this, what this tells the toolchain is that um, .NET is going to be pre-installed on the machine where I'm going to run. And if I remove this then the build is going to package the .NET framework and the whole bootstrapping itself with the application. And if I want to do this, I also have to exactly specify what runtime environment I'm going to use. Is it going to be Windows or Ubuntu or Debian? And I also have to specify the exact version so that the build uh, toolchain, it is going to know what version of .NET it has to package with the application. So I have to create a new property called runtimes. And in this, I have to add a new element. And I'm using Ubuntu and 16.40 64-bit. And this particular string and the list of supported, I think these are called RIDs, runtime identifiers. You can find a list of them in the documentation. And now if I do this, I have to do the .NET restore again because there are a couple of extra base packages that have to be downloaded. And now I have to do .NET publish again. And now if I go into my pub directory and look at the list of files, we can see two interesting things. So one is that we have much more files than we had before. And that is because now really all of the binaries of .NET itself 
are present here so that nothing has to be pre-installed on the machine. So even things like uh, libcore clr.so, which is a native Linux binary, which is the actual implementation of the runtime for Linux. And also many other base packages are present here. And another thing which is interesting is that previously we only had a single binary for our application, mvc.dll, which was a .NET assembly. But now we also have another file simply called mvc. And that is not a .NET assembly, but it is actually a native uh, Ubuntu executable that I can just simply start up without the .NET CLI. So now I can simply say uh, dot slash mvc, and my application runs again. And what I didn't show you is uh, the Docker file that we have to use in this situation. <coughs> it's a bit longer than the previous one, but now finally we don't have to use uh, the .NET image coming from Microsoft, but we can just use a raw Ubuntu image without any kind of .NET bits on it. On the other hand, .NET still needs a couple of native Linux uh, packages to be present uh, on the machine. And this is what has to be uh, installed in our uh, Docker image. <coughs> and then what I'm doing is really simple. I'm just copying all the files again, and I'm running the binary. But now I'm not using the .NET CLI. I'm just running the binary directly, because it's an executable itself. Uh, I'm going to copy, again, this Docker file to my published directory. And I'm going to do the build again. And I'm going to call this MVC bin raw, let's say. I didn't, it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because I copied my Docker file to the directory but I didn't rename it to Docker file, so Docker still picked up the previous Docker file, and I realized it because the output will be much longer. So I have to do the copying again. And now do the build again. <coughs> so now you see that the whole installation of those various um, apt packages is happening. And this is, by the way, I think this is a bit more advanced feature. I think it's not that much advertised or documented, but it has a, a nice uh, advantage that I'm going to show you in a minute. And I can try to run my Docker image. So this was MVC bin raw. And it should still work the same way. Yeah. And what this brings us is that we don't have to use the Microsoft.NET build image anymore, or a base image, but we can use just a simple Ubuntu image. And also what's interesting is the size of the images. So if we look at the images that I have, the first one that I created was over 600 megabytes, and the last one that I created was uh, 330, so almost uh, half of the original size. So we have to go over a couple of extra hoops to get this working, but it, is, it can be worth it because uh, it will really decrease the size of our Docker images. So this was uh, the demo that I wanted to show related to uh, MVC and implementing a simple REST API and creating Docker images from it. And I have one last demo which is really short. And this is about not implementing, uh, sorry, not <coughs> using the built-in uh, middleware of the framework, but actually implementing one of our own custom middlewares. And this is interesting because in classic ASP.NET, when you create a completely new empty ASP.NET project, it usually immediately contains a handful of different HTTP modules. For example, the ability of serving static files, and I think also some sort of authentication is already in there. 
And if you want to make your application really thin and lightweight, you have to do some work and you have to explicitly opt out from having all of those HTTP modules there. And ASP.NET Core uh, has a bit different philosophy. It tries to be as lightweight as possible. So if you create a new application and if you don't add any middlewares middleware to the pipeline, then it is going to be really completely empty. Uh, so it is much easier to create applications which are more uh, lightweight and lean. And the typical way of creating uh, ASP.NET applications in classic ASP.NET was just to use MVC and use the controllers and use the models. And actually, nowadays that is not necessarily that cool. For example, I looked up one of the uh, Hello World guides for uh, Node.js. And if you look at what is happening here, this example, and this is a typical Node.js example, it is not using any kind of MVC framework or any sort of controllers. It is just uh, writing one single function uh, which is immediately sending back a response to the request. And something like this was possible with classic ASP.NET, but it really, it wasn't the first class citizen. It wasn't convenient to do. But uh, now with ASP.NET Core, it is uh, really easy. And this is what I'm going to show you. And what the actual example is going to be is that with a thin custom middleware, we are going to download a file from a Google Cloud uh, Cloud Storage. So we can see that now we, in this project, we don't have any uh, models or controllers folder because I'm not going to use MVC. So I can go directly to my startup, the CS file. And I don't have to set up any services. And also, I'm not adding any middlewares, although I'm adding the console logging. And actually, I'm not sure how this is implemented in the framework. This might add one middleware for doing the logging. But I'm not adding any more built-in middlewares to the pipeline. So now here, what I can say is that I can just directly do app.use, uh, or rather run. And in this function that I'm passing here, I can just directly reply to the HTTP request, very similarly to what we saw in that Node.js uh, tutorial. So now I can say context dot response uh, dot write async, and I will say happy. <coughs> And I have to do again .NET restore, and I can do .NET run. And we see that we get uh, back the response from the application. And this is something that's, um, that's really low level and really thin and lightweight. But this way our application is not even looking at the request. Whatever the request is, it can be any method, it can target any route, it is going to just reply with the same string. And actually in this last demo, just uh, to show a change, and also because I'm going to use the Google Cloud SDK, I wanted to show you the other development environment, which is Visual Studio Code. <coughs> and this has a better uh, autocomplete experience. I will use uh, this one. So what I want to do is I already prepared a bucket in Google Cloud Storage. And what I want to do in my application is whatever route the request is going to, I will try to download the file from that route. And actually, this is something that is typically not a REST API kind of service, because I'm not thinking in routes. I just want to take the, uh, the path of the HTTP request as it is and pass it on to uh, the Google Cloud Storage. And I prepared one single file in this bucket, 
uh, demo txt, which contains a string. So let's uh, implement this in this uh, middleware. Uh, first, I have to get what the actual uh, path or route was to which the request was sent. And I can get it from this uh, context object. So I will say file path, and from the, from the context, from the request, the request has a path, and I have to, I have to convert this to a string. And because the request starts with a slash, but uh, Google Cloud is not happy about that, I will have to trim that from the beginning. So I have to say trim starts. <coughs> and now what I have to do is I have to create a connection to Google Cloud Storage. I will use the uh, storage client dot create which is provided by the Google Cloud SDK. And now I will start a try catch, because if uh, the file is not found, I will get an exception, and I want to handle that as well. And in this try, I want to start uh, downloading the file, which I can do with client.download uh, object async and the first argument is the name of the bucket from which I want to download, which in this case is Happy House Watch Demo. The second argument is the name of the file, or the whole path to the file that I want to download, and that is the path which is coming from the request itself. So this is file path. And the third argument is the stream to which I want to download the file. <coughs> and the really cool thing is that I can just pass in directly the stream of the HTTP uh, response. So I can say context.response.body. And this way, the file is not even going to be downloaded into memory, but it is going to be just streamed into the HTTP response. Mm -hmm. And if there is an exception, I just want to say uh, not found. So I will use the same uh, line that we had before and say not found. So let's see if this works. And I will some, just type in some random string and I should get not found. And if I will say demo, the txt, then I should get the file that I uploaded. Yeah. So this is just an example of how ASP.NET Core was really transformed into a more lightweight framework than what uh, the classic ASP.NET was, and how <coughs> the framework is really pluggable and can be stripped down to really the bare minimum that you need. And that was uh, part of making uh, the framework much faster. So these were the demos that I wanted to show, and I think I have one last slide as a conclusion. So .NET Core is a new version or new flavor of .NET, <coughs> which is modern and, and lightweight, and open source and cross-platform. Um, although I don't want to sound like a Microsoft fanboy, so it really has a couple of pain points as well, at least currently. So related to the tooling, it has some rough edges, especially if you are not on Windows. Uh, if, for example, setting up uh, .NET support for Vim or Sublime, it can be really tricky. And also some libraries uh, don't have .NET Core support yet. For example, Google Cloud has, as you have seen, but as far as I know, for example, MongoDB doesn't have one yet. So it can happen that you might want to migrate one application to .NET Core, but you either have to wait for the library to be migrated, or you will have to migrate it yourself, or you will have to look for an alternative. But that is improving really quickly. Uh, a couple of months ago, for example, we were waiting for Couchbase and also for uh, Google Cloud to have SDKs, and today both of them have. So library implementers are nicely picking up .NET Core 
And the last uh, kind of pain point is that the landscape is still changing uh, quite a lot. Um, and if you want to use .NET Core today, you have to prepare for um, having to um, keep yourself up to date with what the latest changes are, because still the tooling is fluctuating a bit. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you.